Hello, everyone. Today, the topic we have are this uh, bias and confounding in epidemiological research. I have two very special guests for today. Welcome to the interview, Olivia and Charlotte. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, so please tell us who you are and why you're here. Okay, I guess I can go first. Um, I completed my bachelor's of science uh, honors degree with a specialization in kinesiology at Queens in 2020. And so I am now a second year MSc student at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine Rehabilitation Sciences Institute. Um, my research examines sex and gender differences in exercise participation and depressive symptoms in the stroke population. Um, and so I hope by taking an integrated knowledge approach, sorry, knowledge translation approach, um, the study results will fill a knowledge gap of sex and gender specific indicators of exercise participation and depressive symptoms in this clinical population um, and potentially inform the remodeling of uh, stroke continuum of care by removing sex and gender specific barriers, improving access to stroke related health services for men and women and educating and knowledge users. Um, I don't know if this is important, but my research is funded by the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, as well as the Canadian Graduate Scholarship. Um, so yeah, I hope to defend my thesis next summer and I hope to pursue a career as a clinician scientist in the future. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me right. today. Yeah, nice. Thanks for the nice intro. And of course, acknowledging your funding is very important. <laughs> yeah, and your research topic sounds really important and timely. It's about sex and gender, in, it, well, incorporating sex and gender into your research, right? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, uh, yeah like a new-ish scope, like it's, yeah, so it's mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm really nice. Well, yeah, nice, that's good. Um, I'm excited to see your work in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. All right, Charlotte. Hi guys, my name is Charlotte. I am a fourth year's health studies student. Um, I actually took three three last year so Dr. Lee has asked me to come back and kind of help you guys learn a little about a little bit about this topic. Um, I'm actually also working in the NC2 lab which is Dr. Lee's lab as an undergraduate trainee and um, I'm about to start conducting a literary review which is very exciting. My topic is on um, the constitutional determinants of climate change and its mitigation efforts so I'm kind of looking at um, how social and political factors you know contribute to the environmental exposure and health inequities that we see in our society. So I'm really excited. I'm going to choose my topic soon and really start in my research. But yeah, that's a little bit about me before we start. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, I really enjoy working with undergraduate students at Queen's because you guys are great. Um, and all the past and current in situ research trainees, I really like working with them because they're just really right um so yeah. we have a really yeah. nice group like I'm very excited about our group this year everyone's yeah. very committed and I'm excited to see what everyone comes up with with the research yeah I wish we could do more um in-person gatherings but hopefully in the future or maybe in in the winter term things yeah. will get better mm -hmm. yeah all right so thanks for the intro uh let's get into the main topics of of today's discussion so bias and confounding and in epidemiological research bias and confounding are really important because they are related to errors that we have in our study design or data analysis or our interpretation of the results and you know errors can be introduced anywhere particularly when we are measuring health behaviors or health, um, there's especially a, a, a lot of room for when, where error can be introduced. So we're gonna mainly talk about bias and confounding because um, that's relevant to the accuracy of epidemiological research. And I say it again, in epidemiological research, nothing can be perfect. Epidemiological research, just one research, they always have errors, some kind of errors. It could be different from other studies, um, but there are always errors and none of the epidemiological studies can be perfect. So that's why considering bias and confounding is really important. And another reason why bias and confounding is important because they're related to validity. They're, they're implicated to um, validity directly. 
So val validity, there are two types, internal validity and external validity. Val internal validity is about, um, you know, the threats coming from internally, from the study design itself. So for example, when we want to measure physical activity, um, depending on what kind of measure we use, we could use questionnaires um, without, without established validity and reliability uh, versus using objective measure, for example, accelerometer or pedometer. So, you know, when we use self-reported questionnaire without established validity or reliability, then, you know, there would be a threat from, from uh, internally. So that's what we call internal validity, whereas external validity is about, you know, the, the, the representation of the result. So when we conduct a um, study and we have the result and can, is this result applicable to different populations, different countries? So that's external validity. So when we talk about bias and confounding, actually, um, you know, bias and confounding is directly related to internal validity because it's about measurement, how we recruit participants, how we design our study, how we um, control those in statistical analysis phase. So we covered validity. Now let's talk about bias. So Charlotte, um, can you tell us what bias is? Yeah. So yeah, that was a great introduction to bias. Um, it's essentially something that causes an error in your research. Um, and it's usually occurs, I mean, it can occur at any point within your research, you know, during the selection product, product or during the selection process, um, during the analysis. Um, so both you kind of have to like very much watch out for it. Um, and especially in the data collection. So there's a few different types. I don't know if you want me to kind of get into it right sure. away. Yeah. yeah. So the first one is selection bias. So that has to do with the selection process, as I stated, and it's usually how participants are selected within a study. Um, Cause usually, you know, within epidemiological studies, you have two groups. So um, you want to make sure that you, again, you're choosing from random populations and you're not, you know, creating bias and choosing from one select, select subgroup. Um, so within selection bi bias, you know, there's, we can, I can give some examples. Um, there's control selection bias. So this kind of has to do with case control studies. Um, so again, with this, usually you have a case group which will have the condition and then the control group which won't. But you wanna make sure you're, that you're matching both groups for you know, the same sex, age, maybe BMI, depending on what you're looking at. So if you're having super different kind of characteristics for both groups, you're probably going to have bias, especially within the control group. And you want mm. it to be truly representative of the population that produces the cases, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. I have um, a question. Yeah. <laughs> so you said uh, control selection bias is related to um, case control studies. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about case control studies? We didn't get there yet. Um, so study design, maybe some students are not familiar with it. So case control study, we know that there is a, there is a case and there's a control. Um, so can you give us one example of what case yeah, like, control might look like? Yeah, so um, say you're looking for a certain condition or disease, like say you're looking Let's think of good one. Of some a group with hypertension. Mm -hmm. So you want to study something about them. So you'll find a group of people who have hypertension that probably have similar characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll choose a control group. So say you're choosing people um, 50 to say 60 or 65. Um, you collect a group of people who have hypertension diagnosed, and then you'll find and try to match um, another group of you know 50 to 65 year olds who meet similar characteristics. So they'll have the same, you know, age, sex around that. Um, and then you'll be able to see if there's discrepancies, kind of understand how the um, condition manifests itself and be able to, you know, then use those results for people with hypertension. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, you can get bias if you're not properly, um, you know, selecting your participants, then mm -hmm. if you have huge differences in the age, then you're not necessarily going to get the true picture of, of that specific group or target population you're looking for. Right. Yeah, that's a great example. So, for example, uh, let's say you want to examine 
investigate the causes of hypertension. So you select groups, a group with hypertension and you select a control group without hypertension, but they would have similar demographic characteristics. Is that yeah, exactly. correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's great. I can move on to um, maybe the next one, self-selection bias. This one's kind of interesting. Um, it more has to do with kind of volunteering to be a part of a study. So within this, um, so a good example is if you have, say you're conducting a physical activity um, study and you're looking for participants, oftentimes you'll get people volunteering to participate who are interested in that topic. So maybe they're really interested in physical activity and they're also phys quite physically fit themselves. Um, they may not be totally representative of, again, the entire population because they're super interested in that topic. I sometimes think about how we get emails in SKHS from profs and from, you know, kind of pushing or, or not pushing, but um, like showcasing and trying to get through the research that's happening on campus, but they're specifically sending it to, you know, SKHS students. So sometimes I'm, I'm sure they have to deal with a little self-selection bias if they're worried that maybe students who are really interested in that research will be the ones who are volunteering. And if they're looking for, mm -hmm. again, you know, a truly representative sample. So I always kind of think about that, you know, if they, I'm sure have to deal with that and control for them in their own studies. Yeah. So of course, using, you know, random methods to select the subgroups in the population is important um, to ensure that, you know, you're not, you're, you're getting the key characteristics across, you know, all groups, but it's mm -hmm. tricky. For sure. Yeah. So when we are conducting research related to physical activity, we just have to make sure that we go beyond, you know, mm -hmm. SKHS where Yes. Everyone really likes to engage in yes, practice. Yes, everyone's at the gym right? every day. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we have to go to engineering and business mm -hmm. and just. Yeah. Not of, to say that they yeah. don't. <laughs> that they're not totally physically fit. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. No. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's a really good example for self-selection bias. What about loss to follow up bias? Yeah. So that's the last one within um, selection bias. So this has to do with say you have I don't know if you've covered you know cohort. Um, study designed yet but if say you're following people for a certain amount of time usually you'll follow up with them at different stages during these studies so maybe at the beginning middle and end um, so sometimes you'll have people who won't come to the follow-up so then you're missing an entire section of data because they're they have a loss to follow up um, and you know say again if you have a case control group say half of the cases are not showing up to the or like following up with the rest of the study and the controls are you're not going to have again a representative sample because all those cases are lost but all those controls are not so you're not going to maybe see the hypertension or the or the issues and be able to follow through with your research mm -hmm. um, but this can be tough because if you don't have people who are highly motivated within your study this is probably definitely an issue and can lead to bias and it's hard because by the time you're finished your study you can't really go back and if you're stuck with bias at the end it's definitely tricky because then you've conducted a whole study and now you're like what do I do now yeah for sure so major reason for people um stop participating in a cohort study or that that has follow-up period is usually you know from moving to different province or or just you know being lost in contact etc but but if you know the loss to follow up is not random so there is some kind of systematic errors so that's that's the reason why uh, you know researchers lose people in their follow up period it can be a big problem for cohort studies for sure yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah all right, thanks, thanks for the expl explanation and your examples. Um, let's get into information bias now. Yeah, great. So this is the second type of bias. Um, so this kind of refers to when there's bias within the tools or the questions that you're using within your studies. So it's less about the selection process and more about the actual you know, data collection and the way you're collecting the data. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, again, kind of three examples and types I can give under this category. Um, so the first one is bias objective measure. Um, and this has to do with if there is inaccuracy within um, the protocols or the measurements that you're using. So an example I always think of that helps me is say you get your blood pressure taken at Chauvers Drug Mart. They might be different than if you get your blood taken at an actual doctor's office. Um, mm -hmm. The measurements might be different depending on the instrument or how they're, what they're using. So you kind of have to be careful to make sure that you're 
you know, having validity within each of the kind of sets of data using that specific tool. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> No, you covered it pretty nicely. Well, I remember that example from last year and that really helped me kind of solidify it in my mind is it definitely mm -hmm. you would see discrepancies in the results between kind of locations if, or if you're doing it at home, for example, mm -hmm. with your own instruments. Yeah. Um, so the different ways to measure something. Yeah, and another good example is actually measuring obesity. So, you know, when we use, and lots of people use BMI, body mass index, and body mass index is based on, you know, height and weight, right? It's yeah. pretty simple calculation. But, you know, someone with a large muscle mass, their BMI can go well into the obesity criteria, criterion, right, category. Yeah. So, so then, you know, they're not, obese but they're in the obesity um you know category so that could be a problem so that's that's well I already I I guess I covered misclassification bias so yeah. actually you know if we use some kind of you know body fat um percentage measurement then you know they might be in the normal weight zone mm -hmm. because they have more muscle mass and they're gonna have less fat mass so so, you know, they can be in the normal weight zone, but if we use BMI, then, it, you know, they may well go into the obesity category. So, you know, they are basically being misclassified to obesity when they're actually not, right? So that's really common, um, you know, when we use BMI as a surrogate measure for obesity. Yeah, I know there's a lot of kind of controversy around BMI and if we want to keep using it because, yeah, you can be a bodybuilder and then because of your weight, you're falling into a category of obesity and, you know, you're mm -hmm. not going to treat someone who's a bodybuilder maybe for the same health reasons as you would someone who's obese. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you're over, it's 25. The cutoff for obesity yeah. is 25 and if you're 24.9, then you're normal. If you're 25, then you're obese all of a sudden, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Um, and what are the rest two biases? Yeah. So two more. Second one is recall bias. So this one kind of has to do with recalling. So participants recalling and giving honest answers to questions within a study. So say you have maybe a stigmatized behavior or something like, smoking or drinking, um, and you're asking about that in your study, sometimes par participants won't be as willing to answer honestly these questions if they, or if they don't want to admit to it. Um, or sometimes they overestimate or underestimate, um, say for example, physical activity, they might overestimate how much they're actually doing. And so there, were, mm -hmm. there can be bias in the way that they recall the information and present you in like the way you collect the data. Mm -hmm. So that can yeah, definitely be yeah, in my research, I I use physical activity and sedentary behavior measure, measures really often. And if I use self-reported or proxy reported, then, you know, people are more likely to overestimate physical activity because it's good for you, right? Like it's good mm -hmm. if you're being physically active, whereas it's bad if you're sitting for a long time, right? So they overestimate physical activity, whereas they underestimate uh, sedentary behavior or screen time of themselves or their children. So, you know, the controlling for those biases is really important. Mm -hmm. And I also, just to add on, say you're doing um, a behavior related to maybe drug use or HIV or AIDS, you want to make sure that you're giving people, you know, a comfortable and safe environment to answer and you're not, they don't feel stigmatized or they don't feel, mm -hmm. you know, discriminated against because again, then they won't maybe give you honest answers and you won't get the data you're looking for um, mm -hmm. because they're not, you know, in a space where they want to mm -hmm. you know, expose things about themselves. Yeah, for sure. And that's why research ethics and getting ethics, yeah. ethics approval is really important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for researchers to think about uh, those situations and, and mm -hmm. you know, figure out the ways that, yeah, they can minimize, um, yeah, that kind of in situations. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Okay, the last one. Yeah, so kind of this kind of can tie into the, the recall bias, but interviewer bias. So this is related to um, how an interviewer maybe conducts their study and, you know, the questions they present 
or the rules they use to kind of present the, the questions to whoever they're asking. Um, so if their knowledge or opinions kind of influence the way that they structure or present the questions that can have a bias. Um, and so that's why we use blinding. I don't know if your students have learned yet, but blinding is a really great way to kind of reduce the bias. And so, you know, you can have single blinding or double blinding where one knows or both one will know and one won't know and then both won't know so then you totally have you know no bias at all so mm -hmm. kind of depending on what you're studying what you're researching it could be really beneficial to avoid interviewer bias mm -hmm. yeah and and you know as an interviewer you have to be really careful not to have kind of leading questions right so let's yeah. say you're working with the street population and you're studying you know their patterns of drug use or their sexual behavior so that yeah. you want to research their risk behavior then and as an interviewer if they say no then you cannot you know say are you sure right yeah. like exactly yeah. yeah you can question their their answers or or mm -hmm. kind of put your own prejudice onto them either because then it just is not working for anyone and you're not going to get the data that you need so yeah. yeah, having standardized notes and you know having standardized questions that you're asking everybody and not mm -hmm. kind of going off script um, and just proper training, you know, for all the interviewers because you want it to be professional and and have you know the same professionalism across everybody that you're interviewing or every population. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it sounds like Charlotte, you um, <laughs> you have experience in research as a primary. Yeah. Room. A little bit. I'll have a lot more at the end of this year, but uh, I love yeah. this class, so I am awesome. biased. In this sense. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, you're you were the top five students in my class last year, so <laughs> that says it all. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, thanks, Charlotte. Um, that was really clear, and we covered all six different types of biases. So that's awesome. Let's move on to oh, before we move on to the confounding let's talk about okay so we have six different types of biases and potentially more but mm -hmm. in epidemiological research one of the goals as a researcher is to find ways that we can minimize biases mm -hmm. in our research so yeah. um can you tell us a bit more about the ways that we can minimize them yeah def definitely um so i guess within information bias just kind of Going back to that, we talked about having, you know, valid and reliable ways to measure your data. So um, whether that's through instruments or through, you know, standardized data collection processes and procedures, um, making sure everything is the same across every, you know, again, every um, population, everyone who you're interviewing, um, all the data collection is the same. So you don't have any weird discrepancies. Um, so yeah, again, blinding is great. And I'm sure you guys will learn more about that. It's really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess for recall, bi recall bias, again, having a um, safe, you know, and comfortable environment for everyone to, an to answer honestly, and then probably being very transparent with your study, explaining exactly what it is so everyone knows and they're on the same page and they may not have different ideas of what the study is really about and therefore give different answers. Um, and then also if you're worried about, you know, loss to follow up, having a form of financial compensation even. I know some studies offer that and then it really motivates people to come back and to continue all the way through the study because obviously it's very frustrating if you make it through half your study and then half your participants drop out and then you're like, oh God, gotta go back to square run, square one. So, you know, dealing with that beforehand and maybe offering some sort of compensation or mm -hmm. credentials from that. Um, and then, yeah, I know quality control, you know, maybe throughout the, even, the selection data analysis or data collection data analysis and publication always kind of going back and um, looking very deeply at your research to look for those biases and then mm -hmm. following up in the in the limitation section is so important sometimes you'll read a whole paper and then you'll get to the limitations and you'll be like oh there's actually quite a few things that you know they didn't account for a bunch of things came up and so that's kind of a good good place to confess all your sins and, and tell kind of what maybe um, what's happening, what forms of biases were coming up. Um, mm -hmm. So you can always look there and usually you'll find, that's where you'll find, you know, mm -hmm. all the information about the biases in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as a researcher in epidemiology, it's really important to be reflective. So, you know, yeah. you find by all different types of biases in your study, you know, then, you know, your next step is to think about how we can improve them for the next 
one, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's so yeah. important to be transparent because if you're publishing research, people are probably going to cite it and read it and use it. So you want it to be totally transparent and mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with having a little bias. It's not like it's the, the end of the world as long as you can mm -hmm. you know, control for it and then reflect on it, exactly. Exactly, and in terms of measurements, you know, for example, if we want to measure physical activity, of course, using the objective measure would be really important. But, you know, if you're studying a large sample, like more than 1000 people, then maybe using accelerometer is not feasible. So then you would choose to use self reported, you know, self administered questionnaire, but you just have to make sure that you select the questionnaire that has uh, established validity and reliability yeah, exactly. in that yeah. population. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. There are tons of, you know, pre kind of created um, mm -hmm. templates for research news. And if you know they're reliable, um, then definitely be using those instead of maybe making up your whole own set of, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Charlotte. That was really yes, clear. And yeah, and I can see that you learned from the best. Yeah, exactly. This is where <laughs> I get it from everyone. <laughs> yeah, you're really good. All right. Um, so we covered the bias. Now let's move on to confounders. All right. So, yeah, so um, I guess, yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say we'll bring in Olivia. Oh, um, hi. <laughs> yeah, hi. Okay, so let's talk about confounding. So what is exactly a confounder? Yeah, so a confounder is basically a variable that yields a biased estimation of the cause and effect relationship between um, the independent and dependent variables. And so there are three criteria um, that a variable has to satisfy in order to be a confounder. Um, the first two are the fact that the variable has to be associated with both the exposure and the outcome. Um, and then the third is that the variable cannot be um, a so-called intermediate step in the causal relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Um, and so in other words, like the confounder, um, it cannot be situated along the causal pathway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so confounding has to be associated with the independent variable and the outcome va variable, but it's not on the causal pathway between them. Right. Yeah. So can you give us an example? Yeah. So um, for example, like, uh, so the association between like the number of pregnancies that a woman has and having a child with Down syndrome, um, that in itself um, has an association, but at the same time, um, a confounding variable will be, let's say like the age of the mom. Um, mm. And so that in itself is uh, associated with both um, the number of pregnancies, but also um, having a child with Down syndrome because the older the mom is, typically the higher the likelihood of having a child with Down syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. So that in itself, the age of the mother can be a confounding variable. Right, so mater maternal age can confound the effect um, or the association between, between those two variables. Right. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, that's a really good example. Um, okay, so you mentioned independent variable and dependent variable, and we can also call them exposure and the outcome. Um, and also, you know, we, there's, there's a covariate and it's a really common term, right? So I'm wondering, you know, if covariate is different from confounders. So, um, yes, so, co so co covariates are typically, uh, they're continuous independent variables, um, and they also explain or predict the outcome or the dependent variable, um, right. but covariates are usually not the focus of the study, mm -hmm. um, and they are based, like, they're included to improve the accuracy of the study results. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your question, covariates do differ from confounders in the fact that covariates influence the outcome um, only, but not the exposure. Right, right. So confounders associate with both independent variable and dependent variable or exposure and the outcome, but whereas covariate is only associate with the outcome or influence the outcome, um, but not associate with independent variable or exposure. Right. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah. Okay, that's clear. So, um, so in your example, so maternal, if maternal age was not associated with, um, what was your exposure in your example? Oh, number of pregnancies. Number of pregnancies. Um, then that could be a uh, that could be a covariate, and we just need to control them in our statistical um, analysis phase. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, okay. So my next question. Um, so confounding then is a problem, right? And and. Essentially, in epidemiological research, our goal is to clarify the association between the exposure and outcome because we are always interested in knowing the causes of the outcome. For example, if we are looking at, you know, mortality as the outcome, then we want to know why people die, right? Um, right. And they, <laughs> there could be a lot of confounding variables, right? So how do we control all those confounders? Like, how do we minimize the effect of confounders? Yeah, so there are several ways that that can happen, um, and they're largely related to um, either the study design and or the statistical analyses that you run for the study. Um, and so I can kind of go into both of those uh, categories a little bit, but um, so like starting with study design strategies, for example, um, Charlotte did mention a really good one, which is randomization of study participants um, into either the intervention or the control groups. Um, and so uh, RCTs, which are randomized control trials, um, basically what they do is the randomization process increases the likelihood um, that potential confounders will be evenly distributed between the groups. And so that in itself sort of um, takes care or accounts for the confounders. Mm -hmm. um, the second way is by restriction of study participants. And so this basically limits the scope of the participant characteristics. Um, and so like this, this strategy in itself also has its downfalls as well, because it does, first of all, reduce um, external validity. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, this basically limits generalizability of study results to other populations. Um, and so like, uh, an example of that would be like restricting the study uh, participants to uh, recruiting only females over 65 years old. Um, and so this eliminates the confounders of age and sex, but these restrictions um, also general, sorry, limits the generalizability of the results to um, let's say like males of any age or females younger than 65 years old. Um, and so also if restrictions are extensive enough, um, this could also limit the sample size and subsequently reduce the statistical power of the study. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then so the third uh, way that this can happen through study design is matching of study participants. Um, and so there are two uh, different techniques um, and Charlotte did touch on uh, one of them. So uh, the most common is uh, pair matching um, or case control. Um, and so this is based on like, as Charlotte said, like different uh, characteristics. Um, and so you can uh, match like, uh, let's say females um, of a certain age with um, a clinical uh, or, or comorbidity um, with females of, a of the same age without the comorbidity. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then so another matching technique is uh, matching the frequency of the variables between the exposure and the outcome group. And so, for example, if half of, let's say, the people in the intervention group are over 65, then in the control group, this will also consist of 50% over 65 years old. Um, yeah, but between these two different matching techniques, uh, frequency matching, or the latter one that I explained, um, is sort of uh, in, like inferior to pair matching. Um, and this is because the distribution of frequencies of other potential variable of other potential confounders may still exist even after mm -hmm. all that matching. Um, yeah, and so this matching process also um, has its disadvantages. Um, and one of like the more, I guess, uh, profound ones is that it is a more complex process and it's more tedious process of recruiting and matching participants. Um, and also Charlotte did touch upon this as well, but for the... Um, case controls, if you do lose information from uh, one person from that pair, um, then typically that whole pair 
um, gets eliminated from the study. So that's a huge loss of information if you have um, a bunch of pairs that you're kind of losing throughout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And then, so the second category are statistical analysis strategies. Um, and then, so this kind of happens through like two main ways. And then, so the first one is stratification analysis. And this is um, typically used when there are very little potential confounders. Um, and so this kind of involves identifying those confounders and then um, stratifying or dividing the study groups based on those potential confounders and then analyzing the exo exposure, sorry, the, as the association between the exposure and the outcome. Um, another more, I guess, widely used, I don't wanna say widely used, but multivariate analyses is very, uh, I guess, uh, prevalent. Um, and so um, these, uh, so this type of analysis can be used when there are many potential confounders. Um, and so regression models, um, or multivariate analyses, basically they depict the um, relationship between the independent and the dependent variables after controlling for or adjusting for all of these potential confounders. Um, so a study can basically implement um, either um, like study design strategies and or um, study statistical analysis strategies to minimize the effect of confounders. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, that's a really good explanation. So study design phase, if we, you know, try to control for confounders during study design phase, then you're kind of um, doing the work before you actually collect data um, or you actually have the results. Uh, but when you're trying to control for confounders during the statistical analysis phase, then it's kind of a post, uh, post hoc. Um, efforts to to minimize the the effect of confounders, right? Because it's like the data has been collected already, hey. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and multivariate regression, or we also call it multiple regression. So you're basically adding all the potential variables that you have collected as a researcher into one regression model. So with the exposure, right? So that, you know, the covariates or confounders get, you know, are accounted for when examining the relationship between independent variable and the outcome variable. Exactly. Yeah, yeah nice, yeah. thanks. That was really comprehensive. Um, all right, so the last thing, um, so we are trying to control for confounders and biases and, and like I said, none of the epidemiological studies can be perfect. So it's really important to just try to minimize errors being introduced in, into our study design or into our statistical analysis or the result. Um, but what are the major issues related to confounding? Um, so there are quite a few issues related with confounding. So, um, as mentioned before, like confounders are um, a type of systematic error. And so this basically threatens or weakens internal validity. Um, and so this can happen through confounders basically either overestimating an association. And so this will be known as like a positive confounder um, or they can also underestimate an association. And so this is more of a negative confounder. Um, however, in certain situations um, and to a certain extent, if the confounding variables or um, the effect of the confounder is large enough, it can actually make associations appear opposite to what they actually are. So a positive association can now turn into a negative association purely based on the confounders. And so that's, um, that's a major concern. Um, there's also something called residual confounding. And so residual confounding is basically after you've taken all of these things into consideration. So you've controlled or you've adjusted for confounders in let's say like your multiple regression analysis, right? Um, confounders still exist. Um, and so these confounders can be ones that um, you didn't observe in your study. And so um, residual confounding is a thing. And so um, that can exist no matter how much you've controlled for them. Um, and then also confounding impacts different types of studies to different extents, right? And so what we discussed before, like the randomized control trial, um, confounding, uh, basically like RCTs minimize uh, confounding, but in things like observational studies, um, observational studies can't control their 
um, independent variables, so to speak. I can't control their environment. And so um, confounding is um, a major limitation of observational studies. So I guess like the end all be all is confounders are found in nearly every study. And so no matter how much you control for them, there uh, still will be uh, somewhat of residual confounding. Um, so I guess the only thing you can do is try to control for them as much as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. so. so again, none of the epidemiological research can be perfect. And that's why we already we covered the hierarchy of evidence. So, you know, at the base, there's at the base of the pyramid, there's, you know, like observational studies, cross-sectional, ecological, whereas as we go up, so increasing validity and quality of studies, we have RCT and systematic review where we collate all the available evidence on the same topic and we are synthesizing evidence based on this. So yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, wow, that's it. This is great. Uh, thanks for covering uh, bias and confounding really comprehensively. This was great. Um, and I appreciate for you to um, coming in. So I'm wondering if there's any final remarks or any words to our students to enlighten them? <laughs> um, I would just say, keep doing what you're doing. You know, it's definitely tough. The beginning of the semester is always crazy and hectic, but um, if you guys are here, you're in third or fourth year, you know, you're, you're already halfway done, over halfway. Um, and, you know, take time for yourself and just to make sure that you're, you know, checking in on yourself because university is hard and um, you don't have to be hard on yourself. So I definitely think, you know, just taking time to decompress and to enjoy, you know, life a little bit throughout university is important. Um, and I know that, you know, enjoy 323. It's a really great course. Maybe it will spark your interest in research. There's so much research opportunity within this faculty. So definitely look into it because it doesn't have to stop at this class. Nice. Self-care. Yeah, my words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thanks for that, Charlotte. Um, Olivia? Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, I definitely, like, when I started my graduate studies uh, last September, um, I definitely uh, appreciated all these concepts a lot uh, more, I guess. Um, and so all these concepts that, like, you're learning in Health um, 323, like, if you're going to be pursuing research or graduate studies, which is a pretty common route that a lot of science students take. Um, yeah, definitely pay attention because they will help you a ton uh, when you are doing like your master's or PhD. Um, and yeah, also self-care. I mean, uh, mental health is huge. So um, just take care of yourself um, and definitely, uh, yeah, enjoy your final or third or final year of university. So yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, that's great. Okay, everyone, you heard uh, what Olivia said. Health 323 class is awesome. <laughs> it and is. You're gonna <laughs> it. <laughs> it really is. Right. Really. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for coming in. And yeah, I enjoyed uh, talking to you both. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank Good you so much. much. Thanks. All right.